Welcome to Worlds Apart. If you look at the registry of global concerns, climate change is definitely at the top of the list. There is no shortage of conferences, reports, or documentaries that all point to a rapid and dramatic shift in global weather patterns. But as politicians and scientists still wrangle over the extent of human input, an increasing number of island nations are left largely alone in the pathways of more frequent and more ferocious hurricanes. Has the debate over the causes become a deflection from the consequences? Well, to discuss that I'm now joined by Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of Dominica, a nation in the Eastern Caribbean that was all but decimated last September by Hurricane Maria. Prime Minister, it's great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time and your hospitality. Thank as you well. very much. The pleasure is mine. Um, nature usually doesn't care about fairness, but I think the on the on the human level, the fate of your country is deeply unsettling because uh, Dominica actually tried to be environmentally conscious uh, more than. 60% of your territory used to be covered by protected rainforest. You invested in the renewables, you focused on ecotourism, and yet, despite all your efforts to be good, you were hit the hardest. How do you process that? Well, it's a, it's a difficult uh, experience. Uh, the reality of global warming is real. The reality of climate change is real. And what we've been saying to the international community is that we do not contribute uh, any significant uh, proportions to the global gas um, gases, the carbon gases, uh, but we are the we're the most affected. We're on the front line of climate change and the effects of climate change. And you've been saying that to the international community, but I wonder what is the international community responding to that? I think people accept it. People accept that the Caribbean, Dominica included, uh, is on the front line of global global global. Um, um, global warming and the effects of climate change. But I think they, they are, we're having too many discussions and conversations about climate change and not taking sufficient practical action mm -hmm. uh, to minimize the impact of such disasters on countries like Dominica. Mm -hmm. Speaking about practical action, uh, from what I heard, Hurricane Maria claimed more than 200% of your GDP almost overnight. When you lose so much so quickly, where do you even start in trying to well, it's regain a, it? It's a monumental task. Um, everybody's lives, um, life has been impacted. The economy has been dramatically impacted to 226% of the GDP, as you quite rightly indicated. It has reversed all of the gains we've made in a generation. Um, so the task really is to seek to rebuild the lives of the people, but take the opportunity uh, to, to create the world's first climate resilient nation and ensuring that what we can do for ourselves, by ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, to mitigate against such um, ferocious uh, climatic uh, conditions, mm -hmm. uh, that's how we're going to be approaching. I know that you've got a bachelor degree in psychology and I, I assume that kind of experience would come in handy, especially given how traumatized and anxious, I suppose, your people are. From what I've seen, Dominicans are very resilient, but I know that sustaining resilience over a long period of time, especially when 100% of your people are affected, is very difficult. Have you given any thought on a personal level what kind of leadership there they would be expecting from you? Well, you know, time? time is not on our side as a country and as a citizenry. So we have to act very quickly in a number of areas in providing shelter for, for citizens, ensuring that the most vulnerable are provided with um, adequate means of, of food and, and all of basic supplies, uh, ensuring that they can take care of their families. So what we're seeking to do is to ensure that people's lives get back to normal as quickly as possible. But that will also be hampered by your access to resources. Uh, the country hasn't been earning any significant revenue uh, since the hurricane, but our costs of responding to the relief and the recovery uh, is growing every single day. Mm -hmm. It's important to you, and I think that's the advice many psychologists would give in the situation of trauma. You just have to keep busy and that's doing, right. uh, you know, attending to your daily yeah. uh, life and daily activities. But I, it's also very hard for me to believe that um, 
at least for a second, you are not paralyzed by fear of that ferocious force returning. Have you looked that fear in the eye? Yeah, I mean, you, it's a reality that you have to live with. Um, but we have no control over the uh, patterns, what we're seeking to say to the developed countries. Let us minimize on your um, emissions, gas emissions, um, so that we can get the oceans to be a bit colder and not as warm as it is now and getting warmer. But that is a very monumental task. I mean, that would take decades, if not more, to change. And but we have to start. We have to start somewhere. And I think, I think it is not only with us as leaders going to Paris and and negotiating an agreement and signing off and, and boasting to ourselves and to the world that we have reached an agreement in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, but we cannot see the operationalization of this agreement. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying to the international community as small island developing states is that time is not on our, is not on our hand. I mean, the entire Caribbean could have been uh, wiped away by these two Category 5 hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And it is unprecedented in our history. So I believe that if there is a serious uh, commitment to the science behind climate change, which all, the majority of world leaders, except with the United States uh, president, who has agreed that climate change is real, it must be seen mm -hmm. in a practical sense. And, and, and what we're saying to the International Committee is that you have an obligation, you have a responsibility, because we did not start the war. The war has been visited upon us. Let me ask you a few questions on Dominica, because uh, you've already said that you want to build Dominica or rebuild Dominica into the world's first uh, climate change resilient community. What exactly do you mean by that, and what would that take? Ensuring that we continue to protect the environment, and you indicated in your opening points uh, that we have been uh, friends of the environment long before climate change became a fashionable term. Um, more than 60 percent of countries protected by rainforest, uh, by law, um, or marine. We have several marine reserves in the country, uh, three of them. Um, we've been promoting ecotourism, so all our development has been around the environment. What we're seeking to do is to build more resilient infrastructure. Uh, to ensure that our construction, our homes, our businesses, our properties um, can withstand a Category 5 hurricane. But the you, I'm sorry for interjecting, yeah. you cannot do that without the help of the international without, without community. Without the because just for housing alone, we're going to need about 250 million U.S. dollars uh, to build in excess of 5,000 homes for citizens. So to this very, I think, uh, interesting idea of turning your extreme vulnerability into your asset, you know, building the first That's real... Right life lab for uh, studying the effects of global warming. Have you heard any practical response? There has been some. There has been some. Uh, we just came from uh, a donors conference in uh, the United Nations in New York, uh, where uh, for the Caribbean, $2 billion uh, were, were pledged. Uh, we want to ensure that those pledges can be materialized in a quick time, because there's one issue of making fund, uh, committing funds to us there's a second and more fundamental point of accessing those funds because the, the, there's a very protracted process um, that takes years. Uh, the next hurricane season is about six, seven, eight months away. And, and therefore, time is out on our side. The, as a matter of fact, time has passed away, uh, passed, passed by uh, in respect to preparing ourselves, uh, allowing ourselves to be more resilient, um, to put in mitigation systems in place so to, what protect, you're saying to protect life and property. Is that the international community supports you in principle, in words, in assurances, but not exactly in not, uh, material not, terms? Not, not to the extent. There's, there's empathy, there's sympathy, there's concern, there's a reality that we're facing. Um, but we would like to see a greater effort on the part of the international community, especially those of us who um, espouse our support uh, for climate change um, and for the effects of climate change and for the need for us to take action as global leaders uh, to protect islands like ours. We have nowhere to run to, mm -hmm. unlike the bigger countries with many states and many provinces um, and the extent of the, of the economies. Now, Dominica has had some experience in diversifying our reinventing its economy. You used to rely on banana experts a lot, then you diversified into tourism, but both of these income generating uh, industries are highly weather and climate sensitive. Um, are there any sectors uh, that would allow you to develop your economy on your own and decrease that reliance on, on the natural habitat? Well, what you found out was in regards to, you may have heard about the Economic Citizenship Program I heard about the Citizenship it. by Investment Program. This has been the only source of revenue for the country. 
And I can say without any fear or contradiction, had it not been for that program, uh, we would not have been able to provide for our, our citizens um, currently. Mm -hmm. um, this is what we've been using to help clear the roads and streets. This is what we've been using to buy food and supplies for our citizens. This is what we'll be using to pay our debt. We have been using these funds to pay our salaries. We have um, paid our salaries to our public servants on time from September to now. So it's a very we'll, important we'll sector for your economy. From it, what it, I know, it, it generates it, around 30, 35 percent right. of your economy. But uh, you also know that there is an increasing pressure from the United States, from the European Union, from the OECD, uh, both on the uh, banking privacy laws and on the whole industry of offshore financing. Uh, we, we, How sustainable is the reliance on that particular we're, industry? We're part of the international security apparatus. We will do everything we have to do uh, to protect um, the security of the world. We are law-abiding citizens. Um, so whatever concerns people may have is a matter of sitting now because a lot of the concerns some of the people have about our programs is about is misinformation. But it's, I'm it's, not it's asking true. you about the concerns. I think the industry as a whole is uh, in pretty hot waters and there are uh, calls to simply get rid of it. No, no but there, there are such programs in, 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 in Europe also. It's not only in the Caribbean, there are such mm, programs yeah, yeah. in Europe. Um, and they, they have the same source market. So it's a matter of us to sit, to sit down and dialogue on, on this issue. But I, I, I believe that um, we have a very transparent program. It is open to scrutiny. But the sustainability of it, you know, um, there will always be a demand. Obviously, there will be fluctuations in the demand. But the, the world is a very unstable world, and, and, and there are many... Uh, Especially in your part of many, the world. Many, many citizens in different parts of the world who are being oppressed for one reason or the other, who are looking to provide a, a safer opportunity for their families and for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, to some extent, they are also affording you the opportunity to sustain your economy, That's especially right. because... Uh, you know, you're so hard-pressed uh, when it comes to agriculture or tourism. But I guess my question is is uh, whether you believe that a country like yours should be given perhaps some preferential treatment in that regard, because from what I understand, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it, ex it is extremely difficult uh, for you to depend on your environment for the reasons that are beyond your control, and it is extremely difficult or increasingly difficult for you to rely on that internationalized sector because of the pressure from certain corners. So it is all, almost like you're caught between, you know, a I mean, hammer. This is the reality of, of small states like ours. Um, it is the, uh, our challenges uh, are not unique to Dominica. You speak to any Caribbean country or any small island developing state, we would echo the same sentiments. Of course, we would like to have uh, a fair opportunity uh, to provide for our citizens. And sometimes we feel that we have been uh, challenged or we've been pushed back, uh, we're not been given a fair hearing uh, by those who have the authority to make decisions for, for the rest of us in the world. We're not, we're not asking for a hand. Off. All we're asking for is a fair opportunity uh, to provide for people, to reduce poverty, to create employment, and to diversify our economy. And some of the very things that we are doing for ourselves, others are doing it, but the very same people have an issue with, with we doing it. And it, it's not fair. But as they say, Maya is right. You know, that's the reality in the world, and we just have to live with it and, and uh, survive within the circumstances. But our people are resilient. You know, we, we do with what we have. Uh, what we have done in the Caribbean uh, to sustain these islands is nothing short of a miracle. Well, Prime Minister, we have to take a very short break now, but we will be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. <laughs> The village of Kalachi has been nicknamed Sleepy Hollow because for some unknown reason, its local residents have fallen victim to a sleep epidemic. У детей могут быть галлюцинации, потому что у них не сформировался головной мозг. Такое ощущение, что у этого кресла появляются щупальцы, и они вот тебя вот так вот прям ноги прижимают, и все. Измеряем вот 8 показателей. Угарный газ, формальдегиды, углеводороды. Это ствол шахты 6. Здесь выдавалась по нему руда. 
180 метров. Опасно. Население здесь где-то осталось. 95 семей в поселке. Раньше было население 6,5 тысяч. I'm Stephen Baldwin. Gosh, I look fantastic. Hollywood guy. Usual suspects. My favorite movie. Proud American. First of all, I'm dressed as George Washington. Sure. An RV enthusiast. This is my buddy Max, famous financial guru, and well, he's a little bit different. I'm honest Abe. You're Abraham Lincoln. Oh my God, they're rolling their windows up. With all the drama happening in our great country, I'm hitting the road to have some fun and meet everyday Americans. I don't know where you're Baldwin. <laughs> to hopefully start to bridge the gap. This is the Great American Pilgrimage. Great American Welcome back to Worlds Apart with Roosevelt's Carrot, Prime Minister of Dominica. Going back to the issue of uh, Hurricane Maria, uh, the thing that was un particularly unusual about it is how it got so powerful so quickly. Uh, it went from Category 1 into Category 5 storm in less than 24 hours. And many scientists at attribute that supercharging effect to the increase of just one degree Celsius that was recorded in your region over the past uh, century. This region, if uh, the current forecasts are correct, is uh, expected to add another two or three uh, degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Do we have an understanding at this point of how bad it can actually be? I, I, think, I think we can, but we can only do so with the help of the international community. Because the cost of the infrastructure that you need to, to withstand such disasters, I mean, there is engineering for it, there, there, there is a technology for it. Is, is the issue of the resources to have those things put in place. I mean, we just built a bridge, for example, in some river defense wall by, on our own, own resources. And what we sought to say to the country, our citizens at the time, was that we want to let you show you the kind of technology that can be employed that can withstand such um, disasters coming out of, of um, tropical storm Erica. And the bridge and the retaining walls survive. Just returned from a big climate change conference in Germany, uh, which decided to postpone the dis uh, discussion on the biting details of the Paris climate deal, as well as the very pressing of uh, climate financing until next year. And I think it's clear that the global north and the global south have a somewhat different understanding of urgency. But uh, how does it make you feel? It's, it's, a bit, it's a bit depressing. And I have said so to our friends in the international community that if we do not operationalize the Paris Agreement, we run the risk of um, there being zero attendance at future COP meetings. Mm -hmm. It is very simple to operationalize uh, the Paris Accord. We know of the political challenges which countries have. We know that the developing world need to, to burn coal to create employment and to generate energy for its citizens. So we're not unmindful of the need for them to do what they have to do. All we're saying is, Help us mitigate against your actions. And former President Clinton put it rightly. All you need is a pen, mm -hmm. a simple signature to transfer the funds, let it be robust in its um, access, and so that we can now speak about um, helping countries build resilience helping countries build capacities, helping countries mitigate against, against um, disasters. You mentioned the issue of attendance, and I don't think the issue that is an issue at all, because, uh, in fact, uh, that conference in Germany was the largest multinational event that country ever held, 25,000 delegates attending. And imagine the amount of resources you need to you know, fly them in, shuttle them around, feed them, all that to allow them to heal your urgent and others' urgent pleas for help, and then decide just to put it away. Do you think it's still worthwhile to hold conferences like that, like that when not only your nation, but there are actually more than a dozen nations nowadays, uh, not only in the Caribbean, but also in the Pacific, who are suffering? Do you think that money perhaps would have been better spent instead of holding that conference in Germany, just giving it to those who are most affected? You see, if 
you are irrational in your thinking, you would say, well, let us abandon this. Let us not attend these meetings anymore. It makes no sense. It has cost my church X amount of money to go to Germany. It makes no sense to go to Poland and so forth. But the reality is we cannot be irrational with this very important matter. This is about life or death for our citizens. This is about survival for our countries. And we must not give up on hope. We must not give up on the fight. They, because if we give up on the fight, there's nothing going to happen. So we have to keep the developed world, um, keep the fire to their hands, or keep their hands to the fire, and ensure that they take the actions that they committed to taking out of the Paris Agreement. So we're not going to give up. And, 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 and if you're asking me, you know, will I be attending the, the conference in Poland next year, God's willing, yes, I will. Mm. Because it is too important for the survival of the citizens the, and for the Caribbean. We're going to, to, to Paris uh, in December. The president of, of France has, has convened uh, this high-level summit to see how, I'm hoping, to see how um, we can start operationalizing certain aspects of well, Paris. Well, good luck to see, with that. See how, to see how we can do so. But I think it's important for us to engage. But can, can I be a little bit brutal? I'm sorry for, for sure, jumping I'm in sorry. so often. That's but okay. I wonder if you ever had an impression that industrialized nations, and by that I also mean Russia because it's a big yeah. uh, industrial nation, while sharing your concerns in principle, kind of decided to let the nature, or in this case, climate change, run its course. And if that means that a couple of small island nations have to follow in the footsteps of the Atlantis, so be it. Have you ever had that impression? Uh, yes, sometimes I do. There is not the genuine desire to address the issues. But as I said to you, uh, as I'm saying to your listeners, you know, we cannot give up on this. Uh, it, is too, it is too crucial for us to give up on it. Uh, but my hope and prayer is that um, the world leaders, those who have the authority to, to make a real difference, they can be the champions for small island states. They can be the champion, as they have indicated, um, and we, we believe that to be the case, mm -hmm. uh, that they're genuine about it, that, that among themselves they can lead the way in, in taking some practical action in, in helping countries mm -hmm. like ours. You, you compare it climate change to war, and I think that's actually a very interesting comparison uh, as a former war correspondent, because I think there is, like in major wars, there is a disconnect between your action and the consequences that uh, follow. You do the action, but the consequences are suffered yeah. by somebody else. Um, do you have any idea what could bridge that potential gap. Do you think the, the countries that have the resources will ever commit them to your plight unless they feel the pinch themselves? I th and I think they're feeling the pinch. But not, um, not, not to the extent not, not to the extent, you, the guys not do. to the extent of it. And I've said to our friends in Europe and North America that 99.9% .9 of the drugs which pass through our islands from South America, South and Central America, go to Europe and North America. When, if all countries are unable to, to, to provide for themselves, what's going to happen if all of these drugs are going to pass through? It's going to go through. We want to have the means of providing the kind of security that we've been providing, the kind of interception that we've been providing to help protect the children and the youth of North, Amer North America and Europe. So you, you what see, you're saying is that you need to start acting irresponsibly for them to actually start paying attention? No, I believe sometimes I have said so to them, that when you're a good student, you get punished for being a good student. That's, a, the, that's the, true. The countries which receive all of the attention and all of the billions are countries that have created problems for themselves. You know, who are not respecting the rule of law, international rule of law, who are not respecting the rights of their, of their citizens, they get all of the billions. But we in the Caribbean who, are, who respect the environment, who protect the environment, who respect the rule of law, and being punished for it. How much is it? How much was the cost of a drone, of one drone? I don't know. <laughs> you see? So, and the cost of one drone uh, could solve the problems of the entire organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And we're not saying another country doesn't have a, a right or responsibility to protect its citizens and in whatever way it determines. But what we're saying is actions that you're taking in your countries are impacting on our countries in the Caribbean in a negative way. Can I ask you one more question specifically about uh, climate finance? Because it is a very pressing subject. Uh, it's also about choosing your priorities. Um, 
I've seen some estimates that about one fifth of the funds and development aid currently goes into the adaption to climate change. The rest goes into decreasing uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But as you pointed out, even Germany, the country that you know prides itself on being at the forefront of fighting climate change, is uh, pretty lax when it comes to keeping uh, the obligations. Do you think that is a fair distribution? And do you think perhaps that so much focus on, uh, on the greenhouse gas emissions may be deflecting attention from the consequences from what actually can be done at this point, regardless of whether we think climate change is man-made or not. We have no difficulty with the developed world using some of the resources uh, to have more renewables in the country, to reduce on the use of, of coal and fossil fuel to, to generate energy. We have no difficulty with this. The issue of adaptation is something that needs to be revisited because in some instances you cannot adapt. You know, for example, our, 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 some of our schools and health clinics, some of them are 50 plus years old. So you can't make mm -hmm. them smart anymore. You can't adapt them. They have to be demolished and rebuilt, um, taking into consideration the present day realities of the climatic um, conditions and, 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 and the changes. So, what, what we are saying is that whatever you want to spend on your country is fine with us. What we're saying is this that which you have committed to us, one, make it available now. And two, um, allow us to have access to it now, mm. because time has passed uh, on us in terms of the opportunity which you have, the small window which you have uh, to put in um, systems to mitigate against the disasters and to build greater resilience in our countries. Mm -hmm. And the very final question, if I may, according to World Bank's forecast, the number of severe hurricanes is expected to increase by 40% if global temperatures rise by 2 degrees, uh, twice as much if they uh, uh, rise by 4 degrees. And I apologize for, for, for the question in advance, but I think it's part feature of a good governance to plan for every eventuality. If worse comes to worse, do you think any thought should be given to relocating nations like yours? No. We can't relocate. We won't relocate. Um, we believe that we can survive the realities of the, of, of the climatic conditions. But you can build resilience. You, there, there is the technology. There, there's, there's renewable energy. There's, there's geothermal, which we're pursuing. There's um, solar, which we're pursuing. We have had hydro for the last 35 years, providing um, energy for us. So there is the technology. But there there is, is the political will. There is, there, is, there is a political will from us, the small island states, within small island states, to, to pursue that particular agenda, to pursue that particular vision. And with Dominica has very clearly uh, articulated its vision to becoming the world's um, first um, climate resilient nation. And what we're saying to our friends in the Caribbean is let the Caribbean become the first um, region, climate resilient region in the world. Where we have a challenge is not having the resources of ourselves. If we had the resources of ourselves, we would not be having this interview with you or, or talking to world leaders. We would be building infrastructure, building homes, and, and, and ensuring that our agriculture is more resilient, our, our tourism plans are more resilient, and our entire nation is more resilient. So, so we, there's no talk about um, moving to, moving to where? We are, we are sovereign independent states. Where, where can we go to? You know, and that is the luxury which the developed world has. And I think, too, it, is, it would be an insensitive question uh, for anybody to ask us about relocating. And I'm not talking about you. You well, to be, to be honest with you, I think that would be perhaps a good way to stimulate action because there's a rise in xenophobia around the world. Uh, people are averse to immigration and migration. Yeah. So perhaps that could be an incentive for people to open up their pockets and finally no, I mean, accommodate your pleas. I mean, you have a situation in Antigua and Barbuda. It's, it's, it's a twin island nation. But it's, it is one country. Uh, and the government of Antigua has had to relocate the entire population of Antigua and Barbuda of 1,600 peoples. And it is not that the government of Antigua doesn't have the vision or the plan to, to build greater resilience in this country. The government of Antigua and Barbuda is, is hampered over the fact that it doesn't have the resources. So the political will is there. We have a plan. We have a vision. Um, we are seized with what we need to do. What we do not have is this, is this so important, uh, so very important uh, element of the money. And um, it is sitting in the developed world, 
Um, and um, all you need is a, is, is a simple bank transfer. Well, <laughs> Prime Minister, best of luck um, in facilitating that bank transfer and perhaps uh, many others. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I re really appreciate your time. And to our viewers, please share your comments now, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube pages. And I hope to see you again, same place, same time, here on Worlds Apart. Thank <laughs> you.